My name is Matt Newman. I live in Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, and it's an honor to be here with Capital Health right now and to share my story, my perspective, and some of the lessons you learn at the most difficult times. We learn some of the, the most basic and simple lessons in life at the dark, at deepest and darkest of times, and that's just a fact. We, we see life differently when we get new lenses put on. So I appreciate the opportunity to share my story with everybody. I started in my career, I graduated in 1996 from the University of Delaware. When I started my career was in financial services. The reason I started in financial services was my father was a financial advisor. My family was in financial advising. I learned these amazing lessons at a young age that made no sense to me. But as I got older, they did. I ingested them and I didn't get them, but they became much clearer later on. So the year is 1996, I graduated from the University of Delaware. And I remember my mom and dad coming onto the football field. I'm wearing this beautiful blue cap and gown. My Angelou just gave our big speech. And my dad looks at me and goes, what do you think you're going to do, buddy? What are you going to do now? I look at my dad. I go, I'm going to join your firm. I'm going to become a financial advisor, too. And in his very thick Bronx accent, he looked me in the face and said, there's no bleeping way that you're coming into my practice. And I was angry and I was mad. I was like, what a jerk. But what he was actually doing is teaching me one of the greatest lessons in life. There's, there's no free lunches. you got to go out and earn it. And he told me I had to go figure out my own business, and then we could talk in a few years. So what I did is I started to become something called a wholesaler. What a wholesaler is, it's companies make mutual funds, 401ks, life insurance. Then they send out a sales force to connect with financial advisors and explain the products they have, why they should use them, who it fits. So I started doing that. And it became kind of my craft. I moved down to Philadelphia. And I'm a guy from North Jersey. I'm a big Giants fan and Yankees fan. Let me ever say that again. I moved down to Philadelphia. And I moved to this part called Old City. And Old City was this beautiful burgeoning area. It was infectious. There was these young people going through med school, law school, starting their careers. I might have been the guy from North Jersey, but immediately Philadelphia became home to me. It's where I wanted to be. I fell in love with it. And I'm loving the place I'm living and I'm starting my career. But I learned all these lessons, like I said earlier, as a financial advisor that I was going to use in my field. And I remember my father sitting down with me. And he said, there's three lessons you got to take to you. The first is if you don't believe in the products that you have, don't sell them. Lose the battle to win the war. If you or a family member wouldn't use it, don't give it to anybody else. Number two, was always be honest with people. Honesty carries very far. And the more honest you are with people, the more respect you'll get. And number three is you got a soccer scholarship to college. Use that work ethic. If you put those three things together, great things are going to happen. And I started my career. And my career started to boom. And in 1999, the market's going great. 2000, it collapses. And my business just continued to shoot up. By 2001, I was the top guy in my company. By 2002, I was the number one person in my entire industry. And I remember my father sitting down with me saying, I think, uh, I think we should talk about you joining my firm. And I looked him square in the eyes and said, you can't afford me any longer, Dad. That ain't going to happen. And that was my moment of accepting my career, my path. I understood I was doing something for me, but I was taking the lessons that I learned from the basics of financial planning, and I was putting them into my career. So everything's going great. I'm living in Philadelphia. Business is fantastic. In 2004, I met the girl that I was going to marry. Her name is Rebecca. And we moved into Old City together. I remember meeting her parents. I heard a lot of things once we got engaged about negativity towards in-laws. I was a Jewish guy from Northern Jersey. My dad's a financial advisor, my mom's a school teacher. My future wife was a very different situation. She grew up in mining country, Pennsylvania, in a town called Pottsville. Her father was a highway construction worker. Her mom was a janitor. They lived in a 500 square foot row home. They were very different than I was. Her father liked to, to hunt, he liked to fish, he liked to build things. I did absolutely none of that. But we both liked to drink a beer and watch baseball, and they were just absolutely unbelievable people. And I knew from minute one that this was my family. This was everything was going to be great. We get married in 2006. Approximately nine months later, our first child was going to be born. I'll let everybody do the math on that one right there. Right before my first child was born, two things we decided: it was time to move out of the city. We we're going to be parents, and that's where we moved up to beautiful Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, very close to Capitol Hill. And I remember my father sitting down with me and said, what do you say every day to your clientele? The job of the financial advisor is to be there when things are bad. 
Our job is to give people good news when they need it the most. Our job is to have a plan in advance of the negative so we can give them some semblance of positivity when people need it the most. He said, do you do everything you say? I go, I always do. I will be the shoemaker's kids have shoes. He goes, did you do the basics of your financial planning? I remember looking at my dad going, Dad, just ran a tough mutter. Just did the broad street run. Beast mode, man. I, I'm in great shape. Eat healthy, all this. He goes, do you practice everything you preach? And I decided I was taking on a new responsibility. I was going to be a father. It was time for me to do that. So I did the basics. I did my will. I did my power of attorney so if something happened to me, my wife would be able to make decisions. I did my insurance planning. A lot that I didn't want to do, but again, with new responsibility comes this necessity to have a change in your planning. So I did everything I talked about. In 2010, my first son is born in 2007, my second in 2009, 2010 my wife is pregnant with our third. We're going to have three in 37 months. It's a lot of responsibility. My father-in-law is over at the house one day and I tell my wife I want to go play golf with my buddy. He works at CHOP, he's in pediatric anesthesiology, he's one of my best friends, he's turning 40. You can't go play golf on a Saturday when you got two kids and a pregnant wife. Your stuff's going to be waiting on the front lawn if you try and do that. But she said, my dad and my mom are down. I go, I'll take Rick early. It's his 40th birthday. We'll be back by like noon, but I want to I want to celebrate with him. She goes, okay, because they're here. So we go out. We play golf. We come back. And my father-in-law, Larry, is sitting on our driveway fixing my mailbox. That's what he did. That was his thing. So I pull up next to him on the driveway. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm fixing the mailbox. I go, you look skinny, man. He goes, ah, my stomach's been hurting, having some issues. I go, all right. So here's the deal. Uh, when you're done doing that, you go fix the lights in the garage. And... Uh, they need to get worked on. And I start laughing and I close the window. And Rick looks at me and goes, uh, there's a problem. I go, what do you mean there's a problem? He goes, he looks jaundiced, man. He's got an issue. I'm telling you, we got to get this checked out. I go, he's fixing the, the mailbox. What are you talking about? There's an issue. So we go in and my wife and my father in law are like two peas in a pod. They're unbelievably similar. And he tells her that. So she sets an appointment at the University of Pennsylvania. Take him down to the hospital. That Father's Day, we have my family there. My brother's got his kids there. We're appreciating life. We're living in the moment. We're, we're understanding things have gotten a lot different for us. And I remember the phone rang for Larry, and he picked it up. And that was the moment at 60 we found out he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. My first experience with cancer came when I was 15 years old. My grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. I wasn't old enough to understand it. I wasn't old enough to, to digest it and see what was really going on. But I remember one day, she was Grandma Harriet. The next day, she was wearing a cancer turban, and the next day she was gone. What I do remember is the pain and anguish it put my mother through. My mom and my grandmother spoke every single day. Every weekend we were at our house or at their house in Fairlawn, New Jersey, and I watched this devastation and this pain, and my mom became a different person, and it built up this anger and hatred for me on cancer. I wish I was old enough to have been there and give her the right hug. I wish I was old enough to understand it, but I was 15, it didn't make sense to me. Very similar for Rebecca and her dad. She's pregnant, she's got two kids under three years old, and she made it her full-time job to, to drive them every day up and down to the University of Pennsylvania. He got a Whipple procedure, he went through chemo and radiation, and I remember him sitting with me telling me that he was gonna fight, and the reason he was gonna fight is one, he wanted to see all his grandkids born. And number two, he wanted them all to be old enough to have some type of memory of him, aside from just looking at a picture. What I saw was inspirational, I was a warrior. He never bitched, he never complained, he took on the responsibility they had and did what he had to do and so did Rebecca. And watching them together is what you learn what family really is. Family just does what they have to do. And his cancer came like a roller coaster. It would go up, it would go down, we'd get good results, we'd get bad. But we all know that the survival rate is 8-9% to 9 on pancreatic cancer. And it's usually lasts about 6 months. He'd be going downhill, he'd come uphill, downhill, uphill. We get to 2013. He's still hanging in there. Two and a half years he's made it. He's trying to do everything that he said he was going to do. And I'm driving on a snowy, miserable, icy day in Bridgewater, New Jersey on Route 202, not too far from Capitol Health. There's accidents all over the side of the road, fender benders. I do this every day for work. I'm like, I ain't dealing with this right now. I'm just going to go nice and slow. I come up to a traffic light at a road called Chubb Way. I hit my brakes. My car hydroplanes right into the car in front of it, flips over, goes into the median, the airbag goes off, and I remember holding that steering wheel going, all that working out I'm doing is for this right here. I get out of the car without a scratch on my body. Police come over to me, they're like, dude, you gotta get to a hospital right now. I'm like, oh, no, man. B 
beast mode. I'm good. I got this. They go, you gotta go. I'm like, I'm all right. So I call my wife, who's down at the King of Prussia Mall, in between taking her father back and forth for chemotherapy. And I go, Rebecca, the car's towed. Hold on, I'm okay. She goes, you gotta go to the hospital. I go, I'm okay. She goes, don't forget about our friend Karen Mancini. We've got a friend named Karen Mancini who gets T-boned in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. She had a traffic light. Boom, guy goes into her. She goes to the hospital. Doctors say, you got to send flowers and a thank you note to the guy that hit you. We just found a brain aneurysm on you. You'd be dead in three hours. Took a deep breath. Thought about my kids now at three. And like a type A personality, I rented a car and I went on my way and I went and conducted my business. That night I get home and my head is killing me. I've never really had a bad headache before. And my wife suffers from chronic migraines. So I remember that night, I'm sitting there going, oh my God, my head. And it got worse and worse. And she looked at me, she goes, go to the hospital? I go, no. She goes, I don't want to hear about it. Try getting chronic migraines. Over the next two weeks, it got worse and worse every single day. And the pain got more and more severe. And I kept thinking, did I bang my head during that car accident? I mean, did, am I forgetting something? So after two weeks, I started to lose all ability to sleep. I would pass out on my couch from 8.30 to 10 o'clock and I'd wake up wide awake in massive pain. And this is getting worse and worse. A month into it, I'm giving a presentation at Bridge, in Bridgewater, New Jersey as well, at a place called Maggiano's Italian restaurant. I speak all over the country. I do this nonstop. I could do this with my eyes closed. You want me to go speak on squirrels for 45 minutes, I'll knock that out. And I'm giving a presentation on the basics of, of where to utilize products and financial planning. And as I go to make a point, I felt a hot flash hit me in the face. And when that hot flash hit me in the face, just slur and gurgle poured out of my mouth. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was going on. And I saw myself standing outside my body saying, you're having a stroke. You are having a stroke right now. It felt like an eternity. It was probably five to six seconds. I kind of got myself together like, oh, brutal sinus infection. Things are going bad. Let's bounce back into this. I finished my presentation. I was scared out of my mind. And a friend of mine from BlackRock walks up to me. He goes, dude, what was that? What are we talking about? He goes, I've done hundreds of these with you. You don't miss a word, man. I'm like, listen, yeah, my head's been killing me. I'm just sleeping bad. He goes, I'm going to tell you something I never told you. When I was six years old, I got hit in that with a baseball bat. I've been on anti-seizure medication for 38 years. Dude, you got to go to hospital right now. I'm like, no, man. you're out. And I've known this guy for 20 years. I'm like, no, nah, you're out of your mind. I was unbelievably scared. We run the Broad Street Run every year. And a lot of the training we do is right on the Delaware towpath, which is real close to where we are at Capitol Health. And me and my wife are training for the run. She likes to talk while she runs. I like to look, put earphones on and not talk to her while I'm running. So as we're running down the towpath, she asks me a question and a hot flash hits me. And she stops, she goes, what the hell, I'm talking to you. I'm like, I just had another one of those things. We went right to the doctor's office and they told me that it was sinus infections and all this other stuff and I'm like, oh, I don't, don't say what I think you're going to say. They go, we want you to take Xanax, this. I'm like, whoa, 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 not in this temple. That, that ain't going to happen. I try to take no medication ever. So they give me all these meds. They tell me it's a cocktail. I'll help navigate out. I took it one night. I woke up the next day in a haze. It was horrible. And I kept getting these strokes. In, on May 13th, May 14th, 2013, I was given a presentation in my hometown of Parsippany, New Jersey, in front of a few hundred people. And I felt the 11th hot flash hit me in the face. I turned my back on everybody to point to a PowerPoint so they wouldn't see what was going on because I knew the deal. That was the moment I decided I need to go to the hospital right now. I called my wife. She's again, she's at the King of Prussia Mall. My father-in-law is going through chemotherapy again. His roller coaster is heading down. I tell her what's going on. I go, I go, I go. We got to go now. And I decided I was going to come to Capitol Health. I had a 90 minute ride. My head was all over the place. Maybe this is no big deal. I know how great this place is. Maybe they're just going to give me some medication. They're going to fix it. Maybe I'm going to die. I, I don't know. So we come down to Capitol Health. I meet her in the parking lot, the oncology parking lot. We hold hands. We walk in. The first thing they do is they tell me they're going to give me a CAT scan. I'm like, okay. So they give me a CAT scan. And three hours later, they come back and they go, Mr. Newman, we know the issue. I'm like, all right, let's diagnose it. Let's fix it. What is the deal? They go, you have a lesion right here. Now, to me, a lesion is a cut or a bruise. So the first thing I'm thinking is, car accident. 
They go, you have massive pain. I'm like, oh, you don't know the half of it. It's causing you not to sleep. I'm like, yeah. They go, Mr. Newman, you're not having strokes. You're having seizures. So they want to give me all these MRIs, MRAs, and all this other stuff. So during this going on, we call my friend, Dr. Rick Levy, who's now at Columbia Presbyterian and runs pediatric anesthesiology. And he gets one of his buddies, John, on the phone, who's an oncology at Johns Hopkins. We needed to make sure we were in the right place. I did a 20 minute phone call with them, handed it to my wife, she comes walking back into the room, and when we found out the names of the doctors, the names of everything going on at Capital Health, they assured us, don't go anywhere. I can tell you that if they would have said, get on a plane and go to Oklahoma right now, I would have walked out. He's the godfather of one of my children, he's my closest friend, and we trust him more than anything. And to hear that we were not only in the right place, but we were four miles from our house, was an unbelievable burden off of my shoulders. So my wife says this to me after all these tests, it's three o'clock in the morning, not, uh, I'm going to go home because I'm only five minutes away. I'm going to make lunch for the kids. I'm going to find a ride for my father-in-law to get his chemotherapy. And I'll be back in like an hour. Now I have to go into the, the tube to get an MRI, an MRI this time with contrast put in. So they walk in with a wheelchair. They go, Mr. Newman, you got to get in there. I go, I don't have to get in there. I just did the Broad Street run eight days ago. I could walk down there. Mr. Newman liability. All right. So I get in the wheelchair, and the woman grabs the clipboard from behind it and goes, all right, Mr. Newman, MRI, MRI with contrast. We need to see how big your brain tumor is. And that was the moment at 39 I was told that I had brain cancer. Put me in the tube for it was well over an hour. My head was spinning all over the place. I was trying to digest what happened. That, to me, brain tumor, brain cancer, you're going to die. My father-in-law's fighting pancreatic cancer. His roller coaster's heading down. I got three kids under five years old. So they brought me back to a room. They plugged me into about 30 different machines. I started to cry. And I started to have retrospective on life. And think about it, I must have done something to cause this. I think I'm a good father and I'm going through, I'm a good dad. I'm go and strength is not how big your arms are. Strength is not how much you bench press. Strength is something that's deep down in our bellies that at the deepest and darkest of times, we can find it, we can grab it, and we can own it. And I never knew I had that, and I saw it, and I grabbed it, and I just started cursing my brains out. And all these nurses came running into my room, and they went, oh my God, are you okay, are you okay? I looked at them, I said, I'm fine. That was my pity party. My pity party was over. If I was going down, I was going down swinging. So that morning, the surgeon and my wife come walking in, and my wife's drying her eyes. He looks at me and goes, let me tell you what we're going to do. I go, let me tell you what you're going to do. You can get this crap out of my head and I'll take care of the rest. I ain't going anywhere. And that's when I learned what the downward spiral was. And I saw a study from the American Medical Association that pointed out that so, there's some diseases that are going to take us physically. They're never going to take us spiritually. There's some diseases we have the opportunity to remain here physically, but we own our legacies. We define ourselves. If we turn that over to the disease, we're giving them something that's ours, that's our property. But what they showed me is the number one most important thing about beating a disease that you have a chance to beat is attitude. And the downward spiral, if you fall into that spiral of regret, resentment, negativity, the odds of getting out of it are almost zero. Think of the couple that's married for 50 years. Husband dies of cancer. Wife's healthy as a horse. What do we often hear happens six months later? She dies. She falls into it. All they did is pour gasoline on a fire for me where if I was fired up, now I was ready to start punching anybody that walked in. And I'll never forget my moment at Capital Health was I had to get something called an EEG put on. And they had to put all these things all over my head and it took hours for them to do. So the woman's in there in the room with me and Rebecca says, I'm going to come back in a few minutes. And she leaves the room. And this woman's putting all these little things on my head and she's behind me so I can't see her. And she says, Mr. Newman, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. She goes, I had a brain tumor seven and a half years ago. And the next thing you know, I'm touching her scar. She's telling me what she can do, what she can't do. How her life has changed. And you know what I thought? If she could do this, I could do this. That was the exact moment I stopped believing in irony. She was in that room with me for a reason. I'm forever grateful for that. So Rebecca comes back and says, our parents are on the way. I know what it means. Brain cancer means you're going to die. And I also realized that my father-in-law is not coming over, my cancer partner is coming over. 
the person who taught me independence, dignity, fight, warrior mentality. This happened for a reason. So I see my mom and dad walk in. My dad gives me that, hey bud, how you doing? Yeah, I saw the fear in his eye, I saw the hatred, I saw the anger. You could fake it all you want, I saw where it was. I said, dad, sit down, I want to show you something. And I pulled out my iPad. He goes, what's that? And the first thing I did is I pulled up my will. And I showed him it was done. I pulled up my life insurance. Done. I showed my power of attorney. I went through everything. And I took that iPad and I threw it on the back of the bed. I said, Dad, there's only one thing on my mind. He goes, what's that? I go, getting better. My wife doesn't have to worry about this. My kids are going to college. Everything I ever talked about is done. Every speech I ever gave was actually about me. My only focus is beating the crap out of this disease. And for the first time in my life, I saw my dad break down and cry. And I didn't. I was in beast mode. And they told me on that Wednesday that that Friday I was going to get a craniotomy. They were going to cut my head here. They were going to pull the jaw back. They were going to take the tumor out. Ten days later, I'd know the results of the biopsy. And, you know, hopefully I'd go home five or six days later. They gave me that surgery on Friday. One of my favorite things about Capital Health is they didn't tell me something that I'm so glad they didn't tell me. That after you get that surgery, you know what you can't go on? Painkillers. I got two Tylenol. But I was already in this position of, you know, laying there. If I would have known that in advance, I would have been scared out of my mind. But what are you going to do right there? I could have done without the pain, with a little more when they were taking the staples out of my head. But we'll let that go, Capital Health. We're okay with that one right there. So what happened is I go in on that surgery that Friday morning, like I mentioned. I was very into healthy eating and, and fitness and all that, and I realized wealth and health are extremely well combined. I went home that Sunday morning, and I remember they brought me out on a wheelchair, and my wife picks me up in the car that I dropped off six days earlier. She brings me back to my house. We pull up the driveway, and we have a side entrance that you can get into. And I was seeing life differently. I was understanding the moment. I had an appreciation for things I didn't have before. I was taking these lessons and I was owning them. They were mine and I wasn't going to give them back. I remember walking in the house. I see my five-year-old, four-year-old, and two-year-old holding these little signs that say, I love you, Daddy. Thank you for coming home. I just started to cry out of joy and appreciation that I was there. I went up to my bed. I fell asleep for 13 hours. You want to hear home is where the heart is? That's where it is. And my family was there. Day five. I'm walking around my house trying to do things, trying to stay mobile. I have a second head attached. I'm not going to find out until day 10 the severity of the cancer. And on day five, my son at Pennington Montessori, which is almost walking distance of Capitol Health, is having his five-year-old Father's Day picnic. And my wife says to me, you don't have to go to this. You look beat up. I said, there's not a chance I'll miss this in a million years. So that morning, I ride shotgun with her and we go drop my kids off at school. And I take my little two-year-old in her little pink jacket. And I hold her hand and I walk her to class. And she looks at me and she says, I love you, Daddy. Thank you for taking me to class today. And that was the moment I looked at it. It wasn't about me. It was about her. When I used to take her to school, I would think, what appointment do I have? Where do I have to be at? What calls do I have to make? What do I have to get done? This was her moment. It was her moment that if I looked through her eyes, I would see life differently. I had to go through this horrible experience to get this gift that I was given. And I go home and I'm telling Larry, my cancer partner, this is unbelievable. I'm, I'm a better person. I'm seeing life from this. My wife says to me around 1130, you don't have to go at noon. You look banged up. I said, we're going. So she drives me up there at 12 o'clock. And my five-year-old Luke comes running out and gives me a big hug. She says, thanks for coming, Daddy. And I am rainbows and unicorns. I'm so happy. And we walk in that backyard. And every dad's supposed to be sitting next to their son with their brown bag lunch for 30 minutes. And we walk out there, and I saw every dad like this on their phone. And I went, oh my God, that was me. I had a black bread. This is, this is their Father's Day lunch, not mine. You know where my phone was that day? It was in my wife's car. I had, I had no anger, no animosity. That was me. I was worse than all them. And you realize... I'm learning these lessons. I go back, I tell Larry, I'm taking from cancer. This is great. We're learning this great stuff. He's doing better. And 20 minutes later, his phone rang, and they told him that he's had to get off chemotherapy because there was nothing they could do. Cancer didn't care about my lesson. It didn't care what we were learning. It didn't care about our family. It does what it wants, when it wants, regardless of our perspective. 
So I started to understand life a little bit better. And day 10, I came back to Capital Health. And I said, I have three questions for you. I said, what's that go? Can I start working out again? I said, well, technically, yeah, but don't go crazy. My wife goes, he's going to go crazy, just so you know that. I go, can I play golf? I go, yeah, I go, good. I'm going tomorrow. I'm playing six holes with my dad. I can go back to work. And my wife looks at him and goes, he's been working from home the whole time. They go, good. Don't sit around and do anything. Like I said before about wealth and health, having that extra energy is unbelievably helpful. They said, just don't kill yourself at work. I go, I won't. But we have some serious news we want to tell you, too. Your cancer is a lot more severe than we thought it is. You have a grade three astrocytoma. You're going to have to go through chemo and radiation. And I thought, I'm beast mode. I got this. Chemotherapy put me in my place very quickly when I took Temidor. I thought I was a badass. I was humbled on how, how difficult it was. And I would never miss a day of working out. I would never miss work, but I realized it was going to have to come in doses. One of the greatest things about this hospital was the radiation unit. The people were absolutely unbelievable there. I still go in and say hello to them. It's been a long time. I told them I wanted the earliest radiation time I can get. They said we start at 7 a.m. I go, I'll be here at 6 in the morning. I'll do whatever I have. This is my life. I own this. Perspective change. Gift that I was given. My gift. They go, Matt, there's a 7, 10 open. There's a woman doing the 7 a.m. I said, fine. I'll be here at 6.30. So every day I would see this emaciated, probably 70-year-old woman, maybe 4 foot 11, weighed 70 pounds. I would see her son, who I'm guessing was in his 50s, walk her to the radiation drop her off, come back to that little room that I would sit in. And eight, nine minutes later, they come get me and go, Mr. Newman, you're up now. Great. So about two weeks into it, they come up to me. And they say, Mr. Newman, I've lost my taste buds. I've lost hair. I've lost, I didn't care. You know what I didn't lose? I didn't lose my will. I didn't lose my appreciation of life. I didn't lose my love of my family. That was mine. I own that. And they come up to me and go, Mr. Newman, tomorrow the 7 a.m. opens up. Would you like that? I said, done. And I'm on my iPad. And they said, uh, we have a little ceremony that we do when someone finishes the radiation. We sing songs. We say poems. We ring a gong. She just finished. Would you like to join us outside? And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I'm okay. When you're done, just come get me. And I picked up my iPhone and I saw my face and the reflection in that pad. And I said, who the hell do you think you are? You're not only a warrior, but we're a family of warriors. Who do you think you are? And I walked outside, and I walked to this woman with the biggest smile on her face, ring that gong, and I just started to cry. And I called my wife. I said, you will be at this with me. What they do at this hospital is unbelievable, showing this appreciation, showing this love, showing the satisfaction. And that's what I learned what strength really is. I mentioned strength before. She was one of the strongest people I ever saw in my life. And as my... As I started to do better, unfortunately, Larry went the other way. But what I used to do to handle my stress is I used to write. I used to write messages and emails to friends and family. I would send it out on my perspective, my understanding of life, my thankfulness, what I've learned. And within, f over time, we had over 20,000 people that were following our emails. I can tell you this, I wrote it for me. I never read one after I wrote it. That's how I dealt with my anxiety that I pushed into my stomach. Here's the fascinating part about this. I learned what cancer really is. Cancer is like buying a car. Do you ever know if you buy a car, you leave the lot, and you see that car everywhere all over the place? Not true. The car was always there. You just never noticed it until you had a connection. I saw cancer everywhere. My catharsis was to talk about it, to write about it, to get it out of my system. What I realized is most people only want to talk about it with people who've been through it and have a similar experience. So as I'm writing more and more, in 2014, I took my children up to say goodbye to their father, to say goodbye to their grandfather, Larry. We took him up to Hershey Hospital where he was. And he was coherent, he was able to talk, and everything was okay. And they said goodbye to him. About three weeks later, Rebecca and I went up to mining country, Pennsylvania. He weighed about 90 pounds couldn't talk, couldn't walk. All he could do was blink his eyelids. Rebecca said goodbye to her dad. And I sat down on a couch and I looked at him and I said, I got this. You don't need to live like this any longer. I knew you were always there teaching me. 
This is mine now. You will always be with us, but you don't need to be like this. And two hours later, he died. There's no doubt in my mind he was waiting to say goodbye to me. He was waiting to have that connection. He was waiting to pass it on. And I was there willing to take it. So over the next few years, I would go through my every three months MRIs and I would come to my favorite place, Capital Health. One of my favorite things about this place is that I can come here, do the MRIs, get everything done. I don't have to go to these satellite places. I don't have to drive to Sloan Kettering. I don't have to drive to University of Pennsylvania. It was more than efficient and everything was done for me here and I'm beyond thankful for that. So I'd go get my MRIs every three months and they'd say the same thing to me every time. Mr. Newman, everything looks good. We're not sure what you're doing, but just remember it's an aggressive tumor. It could come back. I would always ask them to leave that part out at the end. You didn't have to remind me of that all the time. So we get to four years. It's a big deal. I go in for my test and to deal with my anxiety, I'm writing and I'm just getting things off my chest. I go in, it's a Wednesday. We're going to celebrate that weekend if all goes well. And they tell me, Mr. Newman, everything looks good. And so I'm just thinking, don't say it. Don't, say it. don't forget, it's aggressive. It could come back. I'm like, could have done without that part, but that's fine. So that Friday, I take my dad out to play golf. I want to spend time with him. I'm trying to look at life differently. I'm not giving these lessons back. They're mine. I own that. And we come back around 4.55 p.m. And my son Luke is laying on our couch. He's now nine years old, crying his eyes out. I go, what's going on? So where we live in Washington Crossing, it's extremely rural. There's a lot of areas with no sidewalks. He's riding his bike. Car comes flying down the road. He goes to turn off. Like I said, he's nine. The handlebars turn into his stomach. He falls down. So I'm like, what's going on? She's like, his stomach's killing him. So I walk over. I pull up his shirt. There's no bruise. There's no cut. There's no nothing. I'm like, Luke, you're going to be okay, bud. Excuse me. We all fall off of our bikes. Next day, I take him, my other son, Jake, my godson, Gavin, and uh, Luke's best friend, Billy. I take him to the Philadelphia Union soccer game down in Chester, Pennsylvania. If you've been to Chester, Pennsylvania, you know when you don't want to be there? At night. Wrong place to be. We go watch the soccer game. We go to leave, and I'm trying to get out of there and beat the traffic, and Luke is just limping. I'm like, Luke, let's go, dude. Come on, let's move. Gets in the car, we go home. Four o'clock in the morning, he wakes up crying his eyes out. I'm like, I gotta take him to the hospital. This is my day. This is my time to celebrate. This is my family getting together to understand how big a deal this time is we've had together, something we thought we might not have. And I take him over to Capital Health. I take him to the same area I got diagnosed with cancer in, the same area that I was told I have to go on chemo and radiation, the same area I was just told, four years cancer free. So we bring him in there and they go, Matt, we gotta give him a CAT scan. There is nobody in this hospital at 4.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning, there's nobody here. So, I get, so I'm taking pictures of him going, buddy, it's like an x-ray. You're going to be just fine. Give, they give him a CAT scan. And 20 minutes later, the doctor walks over and she goes, can I talk to you in the other room? I go, what do you mean, can you talk to me in the other room? She goes, I need to talk to you outside. I go, why? She goes, your son's liver is completely lacerated. He needs to be medevac to chop right this second, right now. I go, I, I, I go what? She goes, he needs to be put on a helicopter right this second. You know, my first thought was, give me the freaking cancer back, man. Do this to my kid. This is our week. You're doing this right now. My wife drives up because we live five minutes away. Things happen for a reason. Jumps on a helicopter with him. They're gone. We live 35 minutes from CHOP. It's an easy ride. I'm driving down and I am angry. Give me the cancer back. I'm just trying to figure this all out. We get down to Children's Hospital, Philadelphia. There's 20 doctors poking him. We're trying to show strength. We're trying to show vigor. We're trying to show that we're there. We're trying to hold our tears back. And the doctor comes over to us and goes, I got good news and bad news for you. Good news is the liver's a regenerating organ. It's going to grow back. The bad news is if there's a blood infection, we have a serious, serious problem. I guess when we take him home, what do I do? He looks at me and goes, take him home. You're going to the ICU. And you're going for about a week. I don't care what hospital is, whether it's CHOP, whether it's capital health, we don't give enough credit to what everybody sees on a daily basis. Now they leave their egos at the door and they give the support and the necessary things they need to do to families that need them more than ever. And they show strength when they need it. And everything I saw at capital health with my son and everything I saw at CHOP 
those people are not deemed nearly as important to the society that we're in for the amazing things that they do. And I will forever speak about how grateful I am for what people have done for us. When we got the chop, I was well aware that in that ICU for my friend Rick, most people are not going to be leaving. Right next door to us, there was a guy in a hazmat suit holding a two-day-old. I would tell my wife as we're walking, head down, head down, don't look, don't look. I knew if six days passed and there was no blood infection, we'd leave. So my wife shows me a picture of the pilot who took her. He was a guy named Michael Murphy, and they flew out of here. And she was so thankful for the way that he acted, and so thankful for what he did, that she took a picture, like I said, in the helicopter, and wanted to send him something when we got home. That's the way we are, we show our appreciation. So six days later, Luke's able to leave the hospital. He can't fight with his brother, he can't do anything bad for about 12 weeks. But if he goes 12 weeks, he's gonna be okay. We have a moment of prayer of all those families that are there, everybody that we've seen, and for all the people that are doing the amazing work to help them, and we leave. We were more in the same clothes for six days. Next day, I put a suit on and go to work. My wife says, she calls me the next day and says, give me a call, I can't stop crying. That's not my wife, she doesn't cry. I call her, what's going on? She goes, you watching the news? I go, no, I'm walking into a meeting, what's up? She goes, the helicopter that took me and Luke down the other day just went down in Newcastle, Delaware. And the pilot, Michael Murphy, who took us, he passed. We then found out he was 37, with a pregnant wife at home, and a two-year-old. It was the first time I looked up, I was like, really? Like, we're really pushing the buttons on this one. And I really hope they had some type of plan in place, something that would alleviate some type of burden on the family when they needed it the most, because we don't educate people enough on that. And I found a GoFundMe page a few days later. Reality hits us in all different ways. The way I dealt with my catharsis, and I still get these tests all the way, is, is writing. So I wrote a book. And I wrote a book on this topic, and I called it Starting at the Finish Line. I wrote it for me. I wrote it for no one else. I didn't care if anyone ever read it. It was my catharsis. And on March 23rd, 2018, it came out on Amazon. And I called my mom that day. I said, hey, mom, the book's going out, coming out. And Capital Health has mentioned multiple, multiple times in pictures in it. And this is what my mom said to me over the phone that day. You know nobody's going to buy it, right? I go, oh, God, no. <laughs> Who cares about me? She goes, but you're going to put three copies in your safe. And when your kids are old enough, they'll be able to read what really happened and have a better perspective on it. So, Mom, I couldn't agree with you more. And one week later, we were number one in sales in a variety of different categories on Amazon. People are attracted to realness and honesty and purity. They're sick of the shtick. I wrote that book for me. I did it because it made me feel better. And the reason that I think it's done so well is people are looking for inspiration to know they're not alone on the path that they've been put on. And I can't thank Capital Health enough for the amazing things they've done for me. I come for my MRIs every five months. I'm six and a half years free. And I will always come here. And every five months, this is the place I will do it because of the respect, the trust, and the appreciation that I have for how they treated me. But not just me. They've taken care of me. They've taken care of other members of my family. And I'm in a debt of gratitude for them for doing that. And I thank you for listening to my story.